It's essential that you make money so you can do the work you want to do and can pay people what they're worth and value them and have them stay in the profession. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice so you can do your best work more often. Now, if you haven't already checked out our free training on the smart practice method, what are you waiting for? If you currently run an architecture or design firm and you want to live your best life, you need a systematic approach to running the practice that simplifies to allow you to multiply. That's what we do here at Business of Architecture. We've done it for the past 10 years. We're experts in it, and you're just hurting yourself by not reaching out and have a call with us. So with that little mini plug for what we do, let's jump into our interview here. So I'd like to welcome our guest today, Betsy Voss. Betsy has a, a very, a, an amazing resume here. We're kind of going to go through it. Uh, has a Bachelor of Science Design in Interior Architecture, went to the University of Minnesota, got a Master of Architecture. Um, looks like you attended Ayers ASU in their, their Bachelor of Science Design in Interior Architecture program, ASU Great School. It is a great school. I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. So, Betsy, welcome to the show. Thank you. So happy to be here and happy, really thrilled to talk about the idea of business and architecture. Because Absolutely. It's, it's a probably a little bit of a different tact than some mm -hmm. of the things you might usually be talking about on podcasts. Betsy has experience here. So she's, she, has a, she has an illustrious portfolio here. I'm looking on your, uh, your resume here. Uh, your work at Gensler. So you did a lot of workplace design. Uh, obviously, been with Gensler, you mm -hmm. know, you have all the big companies on here, Jacobs, Interium, you know, um, co-working groups. We have just, this is a very, very long list here. So law firms, obviously, lots of things like that. And healthcare experience, medical technology, work, workplace experience. How long How long were you with Gensler, Betsy? Um, a little, Almost nine years. Almost nine um, years. Yes, yeah. you were long lived. That's a long mm -hmm. time to be at one practice nowadays. It is. Um, I was there. They came to Minneapolis, which is considered, you know, it's a smaller market um, in 2007. And I joined in eight. And so we really kind of grew that business um, from really the beginning to when I left in 2015 to start my own firm. So, wow. So you was, saw that you saw that that office grow from how many people to then how many people about, when you left? About? Um, there was two founders and about wow. two weeks after I left that office, one of them left. So it was just two of us. Oh, wow. Um, two, two, yeah, two, I think it was like 23 people when I left. And again, thinking about 08 for architecture firms was really brutal, you know, the, oh, the downturn. So yeah. we, we really built from that, which was really great. And I think very formative to the conversation we're going to have today because Gensler is a wonderful business and I learned an incredible amount at that business. That's awesome. And then, so what was the impetus for you to leave Gensler? That's a great question. Um, because business is prime at Gensler and I do think it's a great, it's the MBA I never had. Going to school, I went to design school through and through. Um, I had in about eight years of design school, one semester called professional practice. And that class taught you basically the monumentality of construction documents and that it's a legal tender and you could get, you know, sued for it. It wasn't at all really the business of architecture. So, you know, and, and I understand the academy is teaching one ideas and how to form those and then practice teaches you to practice. But literally the idea of practice only comes from experience. So I, um, my resume was, has, has been really wonderful. I've worked for, I'd say some iconic designers. I've worked for larger firms, Gensler, the, you know, the most premier largest, largest firm and the small local firms. And I think that arc of, um, experience led me to think about how could I shape a different kind of practice? Because to, to, to the spirit of this conversation, I love design. It is my true love of life. I, 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 it is my calling since I was a kid. But you, to make it successful and to do it well, you have to run a successful practice because it, 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 it's essential that you make money so you can do the work you want to do and can pay people what they're worth and value them and have them stay in the profession. So the reason I left was at a larger firm, you grow into management and you grow away from work. And I love work. I love the work. And so 
there really, it was at crossroads of, I was in my, you know, towards my later end of my thirties. And I was like, okay, either you, if you stay in this role, you will be further and further away from the projects and you're going to sell and lead. And it's more infrastructural work. If, if, you, if, you, if you will, it's building businesses. It's a lot of internal initiatives. It's, it's really tending to the practice of business, but the design part really becomes distant from you. And so I, love small practice. I love the idea of working with teams and really digging in and doing the work. So I thought I looked around this market being from the Twin Cities wanting to stay here. You know, I didn't see a firm where that was happening. And I thought, well, I've learned a lot here. I What's the worst that can happen? Uh, I'm employable. I'll, I'll take a leap and see if I can build something different where I can take Really, I would say the business excellence of Gensler, which it really is. There's, I've never seen a firm run like Gensler in my life, business-wise. Um, it's like a consulting firm and how they run it. But then have the the lifestyle of a small firm, which is where we work with clients and it's 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 a, it's more curated because you're not always growing. I would say that's a it's a defining sort of practice component for me is. We are not trying to be big. We are trying to do the best work we can with the folks we have. So we we curate that flow um, and trying to like build this practice that's financially successful, that's smart, and that really has internally a good ethos. Because if your people aren't happy, there is no way you're going to do good work. It's not possible because people who are unhappy can't bring creativity and problem solving to clients. They can't because they're always working through the angst they have in their life with this firm. And so I wanted to cure that the best that I could and create a place where the, the more senior you get, the more you're still working with clients because it's like, uh, I remember I listening to an interview when I was really young and Frank Gehry being like, you know, in his fifties or sixties, again, really young. Cause it's like 30 years ago yeah. and him saying like, I didn't even figure it out till I was 50 or 60. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of true. Architecture is a slow game, right? Yeah. And it takes a long time. So the second you kind of know what you're doing, it's like you're out of it and into running a business where I was like, let's, let's swing that pendulum back to still being in the work and running a business, you know, just resetting that model. Okay, that makes sense. What would you, what do you find, Betsy, for you? First of all, how long has Studio BV been in business? Seven years as of October, like mid-October. So, Seven years. Yeah, well, congratulations. pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah that thanks. is exciting. It's a critical, it's a critical spot. Now, just to, just so our listeners know, um, you, so this, here's something. So this, you did come to us through your PR representative. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of times firms who listen may wonder, how do these people get on these interviews? Mm -hmm. How does this happen? We like to reach out to them. We like to select our guests. And we also accept solicitations of people to come on here. Um, it takes some, here's the first thing about this, right? It takes something. You have to have a budget to be able to hire a PR company. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm sure they don't do it well, for free, Betsy. Or did you get no, one of the they, free no, ones? No, they don't do it for free. <laughs> I would say you have to prioritize telling your story. Mm. It's all about prioritizing. So for me, mm. um, internally, so we run a small practice. We're 15 people. We've been this size for three or four years. This is our sweet spot. We've been a little higher. Anywhere between 13 and 17 people is our sweet spot. But we have no administrative folks. We have one kind of administrator, office manager, and that's it. So I don't have a marketing team. I do the proposals. I write the contracts. You know, my business partner, Courtney, does the IT. So because we don't have internal folks, it allows me to hire people who know what they're doing and can be our consultants. And I... I pay for expertise just as people pay me for my expertise. I believe in expertise. I believe I'm not going to be the best in doing something. Accounting, we have external accountants. Do you know what I'm saying? Legal, we have an HR attorney. We have attorneys for my business. We just, I just believe, just like me, people are educated to do something better than you can do internally. So I try to do that. And early on, I really, really wanted to tell our story because we are going to be a small shop. I know that we would never be a, a gigantic firm, but I want, I think we do amazing work. I think the work we're trying to do in the community is amazing. And I alone can't tell that story. So making sure that I'm doing the best that I can is writing about it, 
we do a lot of photography on almost every project. I do the I do the art direction on that. I I love that. I've done that for a long time. And then we 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 try to get it out there because we want to tell our story for our clients. We want to tell our story for ourselves, and we want to raise raise the visibility of the work that happens not only in this community but the work that's happening in my firm. Awesome. Well, I can tell you're you're passionate about design. I can tell just by I the am. art pieces you have behind you and your oh. amazing glasses. <laughs> Well, that, thanks. Yeah, that you have, you have, a, you have, you are a designer at heart, based upon what I've discovered, which is amazing because we need, our world needs designers. Our world needs people who have that gift and that talent. And like you said, it sounds like you had that that spark from a young age. Now, growing a practice and being a designer is no laughing matter, right? You have, you've no. gone, you have about fifteen to seventeen people over the course of seven years. That's that's impressive growth. Oh, thanks. Well, it, it's from just me to that. So I yeah. left on my own um, and built it from zero, you know, working at Gensler. I kind of jumped off the train was the best way I could describe it. Like, <laughs> you just have to just, I, I was, it was a planned Did it, jump, it hurt when but you it was jumped a jump. Out? Did you hit no. the ground with the thud? No, I, I kind of floated, if you will. So no, it was That's good. good. And, and I had great clients come with me and it opened up new opportunities with clients that wanted to work with me. And I was in sort of an, an, a new paradigm. I wasn't at a gl global firm. I was in a different firm. And it and I also was owning it and running it as a, as a young woman. A lot of my clients are women and they value that. And so I do think it's so funny before you start the firm and you're planning for it, you only know the landscape in which you live in. And the second you move towards something different, Everything changes in such a way that you can't know until you're in that space, but it is pretty wonderful. And there's like suspend You can't like, I'm, I want to, I'm very driven, but I want to know all the answers and you, there's so many, so many things you can't know. So just leaping and believing there's a base, which I always believe that there's always a fundamental, you know, if I feel like this is the right thing, there's, there's something there, but then knowing that that will then grow and become something new. So having walked that walk and built this firm, um, with my team, I feel like, I have that, I know that now, and I, I wouldn't have ever known that before. And so it does take, um, it takes a lot of faith, but it also takes, you know, years and years of hard work to be able to have choices, right? So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and we call those emergent strategies. Hmm. That's emergent strategies, jumping off the cliff and then just seeing what happens, right? Knowing that mm -hmm. we have the faith that we'll move ahead, but I love the distinction that you made, that it's one thing to have faith, like I can have faith and sit and watch Netflix all day, or sit at my desk exactly. and wait for that ideal client to call. I mean, the faith can, I can be manifesting and meditating, positive 100%. affirmations, going to all the Tony Robbins seminars, you know, <laughs> reading all the self-help books, which I've done it all, you know, and, um, and uh, nothing's going to change unless we actually mm -hmm. take action. What's been the hardest part for you going from, it, here's probably mm. what a lot of our listeners are wondering. A lot of our listeners may be in that one to two person range, maybe four people, and it may kind of blow their mind and be like, huh, 17 people, what would that be like? And I know there's a mindset like that sounds scary because I'm afraid if I grow past where I'm at right now, I'm going to have to work even harder and I'm barely hanging on here with five people. Hmm. What was, did you kind of get to that point at five people where it was overwhelming? What was the, for you, what was the hardest really part about growing into the 17 um, people size Well, form? knowing where I came from, so thinking about Gensler, you, you can't, um, and the work that I'm, I don't know, set up to do, if you will, is a lot of office work. It's work that takes a team. Nobody would ever think when I started this practice, it was just going to be me, my shingle, and that's it. That is not how I'm set up. And it's not how complex business projects are set up that we're trying to solve. They, who would want that? Nobody wants just me because I'm only one part of a team, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I would say... I knew I had to build a team at least of six people fairly quick, at least within the first year, because you can't do the work we want to do without it. So um, immediately I partnered with other firms because it was just me. So I was building my team, but I had clients and projects that were complex that needed a team. So, and I was trying to do similar work. You know, I, I, I guess no. when you run a business, I think you have to be clear on a lot of things. The core things are, why did you start this firm? You should be able to write that down every day and then ask yourself, is that still what's driving you, period. And if it's not, why? And if that's that's good, but if if it is, make sure that you understand that you, you know, we have to go back to that. And I do that quite a bit. But then I knew the work I wanted to do was very similar to what I did at my previous firm. So it takes resources. So building, partnering with folks, and then internally, as we could, building up our team. 
So five people is a tough number because it's not big enough. In my opinion, you're either three or you're eight or nine. You really, five is, it's like that 25 number. It's, too, you're not small anymore, but you're not big enough. You either have to be under 20 or 50. It's like the practice of architecture is so weird. And it's not like law offices where you often see them work. It just doesn't work that way. And I don't really know why, because I had one, one business class in school. But the reality is there's a synergy and a layering to people's re their skills and resources, right? And I could, I never intended to be a, you know, a small two or three person operation because I want to work on projects that need smart people to solve problems. And, and that just takes, it takes a team. I would say within uh, 14 months from starting, we had six or seven people. That's impressive. How, what's your recruiting to. strategy, Betsy? How did you recruit those oh, people? Oh, it's, that's a great question. So, you know, Minneapolis is a great town, but it's small. People know each other. There's an incredible amount of firms here, though, because there's an incredible amount of headquarters here. Minnesota is mm -hmm. this very bizarre place where there's like, what is it, like 17 top top 400 firms or 300 firms. I mean, it's just amazing. Like corporate headquarters, it's just very rich with health sciences, technology, um, and food and manufacturing. So um, it's people I knew. I mean, most folks that I know either were people I knew or people I knew of. It's it. I, we've hired maybe a couple times ever people that were completely new to us, but maybe they'd worked at Gensler before. There is like a I would say right now we have seven or six people that were from New York Gensler, Texas Gensler, Chicago, Minneapolis. We have Gensler folks. Um, I would say there's like a, I don't know, I don't know how to say this. It's like if you're, I, I can't say that because people might not like it. But if like, I, I've never been in the military. But if you were in the military and you hire someone who's also a military person, you understand what they're made of. Do you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Mm -hmm. And yep. I do think there's... If, if you've worked at Gensler for, you know, more than a couple of years, you understand like a pace and flow. And those things are different at Gensler than other firms. The pace is fast. The flow is, it's somewhat, I don't know. There's a, there's like a work stream that you come into and you either can swim at this in this pool or you can't. Do you know what I'm saying? And, and that is different than other firms. And I do think there's just an understanding of that. Well, and what is it no, other firms? What do you see? Draw that distinction for me. So help us understand. What's the distinction there? How do you see it? I'd see, well, in my personal experience, in like smaller firms, there's sort of principle-led work teams, right? That are very like unitized by the principal's ability to sell work, right? Yeah. So, and that's kind of how they organize. Where it's not like that at Gensler, you're working along like, I would say, client typologies. You're working around client, I don't know, I would say subject area expertise, but in a way in Minneapolis, that's not like massive. It's not New York, but it's just got a flow that's very different. And it's, um, it isn't person led, it's work led. It's, it's like, it's, it's practice area led. But, um, and so there is also a flow and a pacing to how they do work. That's very different when small firms, like my firm, there's a luxury in working on one or two things. At Gensler, you're usually working, at least my experience was five projects, sometimes six for a person. They're they're working in a layering that's a fast pace, and they're going to have to pivot from working in construction administration here, doing something here. There's just like in if you can manage that traffic for your work, I think that you there's a pacing there that is interesting. I back that down. We don't do that, but if I know the person can, that, that speaks a lot. Do you know what I'm saying? If you can thrive in an environment that's high pace and high output, and also it's not, it's quality work. I also want to just layer it with, this isn't like, we're just, I think the expectations of quality are high and so are mine. If yeah. I can then retool that model and make it a little bit more of a flow, less principle led, because we're one studio, but have people be able to dig in more. And I think that that's kind of the idea of the perfect practice is it's financially successful. It has to be because that comes, if you can't pay people, which I've never laid a person off all through COVID, never, I, we, we, we have been successful. And I would say it was a luxury to own a firm in COVID because I had control. Mm -hmm. And people are your number one thing. You can't get talent from um, some you know, overseas resource. We're an ideas firm and architecture is an ideas business. And that comes from human beings and the human beings you have make all the difference. So for me, 
I guarded that and there was no way. There was no way I was going to change no matter what. We were going to, no, we did research. We helped clients. We did a lot of pro bono, which we already do, but there's no way. And that control was so lovely because I never had to debate with someone the value of their salary versus my team. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because the team is your insurance policy. Absolutely. That's your future. Yeah. Why would you rob your future for, for, for anything? So I think COVID from a business, I was so grateful that I was in the position I was. And I, because I am a very conservative business owner, I, we don't have debt. I don't have debt personally. I don't have debt in the business. Um, I look at it as it's all reflective of me as a human being. And so I want it to be whole. And I will never want to make decisions that I don't think align with my core values. And the people are the values. So, And that goes to creating a place where people can do their best work, but still doing it at a level that we're successful in trying to lead and be innovative. So it's like, it's a little bit of a both end. It's a, the, all, I try to extract it, all the great performance components of a large firm, but all the human components of a small firm and bring that together. And then that, I do think that's the secret sauce to what we're doing. And the fact that I own the business and my priorities aren't making a lot, they're making money, but it's really about making sure everyone feels good, has a good career in design and that we're doing good work for people and we're growing, but we're growing ourselves intellectually as well. So I value different things. I value Got different it. things, but we are financially successful. We've never had a year. We haven't been successful, but I do think COVID was a, for me, the biggest life's test, right? You can say all that stuff when there's no crisis, but yeah, that's what, happens right. when, Absolutely. what happens when you have a crisis? Yeah, exactly. What are your values now? And I yeah. think for me, it was a good test to say, okay, I'm still here. I'm, I, I, I held up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, do you, do you have a target profit margin for the for the practice? And if so, what is it? I don't. I don't. And I don't think about it that way. So, yeah. no, um, okay. we pay. We're obviously a salary for the team. Yeah. And uh, me and my minority business partner, we take a minimum draw every month and then we deal with the profits at the end. So we live we live. I wouldn't say not small, but we don't live our full salary during the year. We take it at the end because I want control over what we do with that because the team's first. Does that make sense? Like yeah. they always we've given bonuses every year, even when it was just like, you know, four of us the first year or five of us. I'm like, I'm giving bonus like that is an important thing for me because I feel like. I'm last to, to eat because mm. I make the food. Do you know what mm. I'm saying? Like it's the same concept of like hospitality. Like if you're ha if if you're if you're the 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 host, then you are going to then be making sure everyone is can you know fulfilled and taken care of, and and then you're there at the end. And right. I, and that has been a a place where I can sleep at night and be confident. And I do think that. I don't worry about this firm financially and I never want to be in a spot where I ever do. Like, because to me, my joy is the work. And so I just prioritize that because I don't have, to, I'm never going to be overextended in this business where I have to worry about that because it's just me. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, perfect. I get it a hundred percent. And I can, I get very clear that you're, you're not in it for the money. It's not all about the money. It's all about the design. The money's a sideline as long as the 100%. money provides for the team members. What, what do you, if you don't mind me asking, what do you take home every year? I'm, I'm not going to, I'll tell you that offline. I'm not going to tell you that here. It varies. It varies greatly. Um, always more than I made at Gensler. Okay. I will tell you that. Okay. And I would say we, knowing what I made at, or knowing what the salaries were at the, my previous firm, I pay people much better than my previous firm did too. Okay. And gotcha. that's important to me because gotcha. I feel like to some degree, if people aren't compensated, there's a lot of things. You can tell folks that they matter. You can give them opportunity. But if you don't show up with the money, there's yeah. always something missing. And it will build. It's always there because people do this for a living and they went to college for a long time just like I did. And and I definitely feel like I'm trying to level up for people in this industry. So okay, beautiful, beautiful. And just so our <laughs> listeners know, I did I did give Vitsi a, a little heads up that I was gonna ask some personal yes, questions. She did. So I, I gave her the permission to yes. refuse to answer anything she didn't want to, so that's that's fine. But thank you for letting me refuse to answer that. <laughs> no worries. Um yeah, if you don't throw the line in the water, you're definitely never going to catch right. a fish, right? I, I get that. No, I totally get that. That's good. <laughs> so, in terms of paying paying your 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 employees, now you kind of already answered this, but I just want to double check. Would you say you're you're lower than the median kind of salary no. compensation, middle, or are you above? 
I think I'm above. And yeah. we're definitely above with our benefits too. So no, we're above. Okay, great, great. And that's that's a common complaint that we hear of smaller practices is that, you know, we just can't compete with the salaries. We can't compete with the benefits. These larger firms come in and we can't afford to pay them. What do you say to that? Well, I say a few things. I take these benefits too, and I want the best benefits too. So, I mean, treat yourself the way you want to treat other people. Um, and again, I know these people and I know I, I care and I want them to have the best health care. I want them to have wellness for themselves, prioritizing that. We did this new thing this year because, you know, I think we, we if we talk about this, you know, everyone, even me as an as a business owner, life's changed. Going to the gym, having your folks have a gym membership doesn't matter anymore. They're solving that at home. They're doing different things with this post, you know, COVID landscape. So I, I said, and we used to do massages in the office, stuff like that. It, people aren't coming that much. So I said, well, I actually have a client, a PR client that um, has this amazing program. And I'm like, do you mind if I ask you more about it and steal it? And they said, no, nope, do it. So it's like wellness your way. You basically have $1,000 a year. It has to be for you. It can't be for your kids and it can't be for a car, anything for a car repair. It could be a plane ticket. It could be a new computer. It could be an, or, or a new camera. It could be cooking classes. It could be new pots and pans. I don't care what it is. If it, if it brings you joy and just you, then it, then it counts. And that's it. Like literally that's it. Because I don't think, and I had a woman who I, uh, works with us and she's like, I haven't had a massage in four years. She's like, are you kidding me? This means I can have a massage every quarter. And I'm like, you can do whatever you want. But like, it's just me saying, spend something on you, value you in a way that's going to bring you joy. And I don't care what that is. And I don't know what that is. Having a gym membership isn't that isn't a joy maker for a lot of folks anymore so yeah, how yeah. can you um and and even giving to charity i mean like literally i was like anything you want to do that's going to make you happy that's not a bill or for your children that that would be amazing so yeah. people responded very well to that it's stuff like that mm. that says i care about what you're doing i want people to be inspired i want them to be happier and happiness comes from investing in yourself too because if you're just Beautiful. if you're just always Taking care of other people, it's not enough. And so all I can do is sort of say, okay, here, I'm trying to cha change the game a little bit in, in a small way. That's beautiful. I love that. So in the smart practice method, which is we've taken the past 10 years to discover best practices about what really works for a practice, right? And I love the way you put it. It's almost, you can almost just repurpose what you've said about how you built your practice. It's the people plus the art, but based on the foundation of the money, right? So we break it up yeah. into four quadrants. We have, on one side, we have, Purpose and people, right? Purpose and people. Yeah. That's what we call if you're into Eastern Eastern kind of symbol symbolology and things like that, that would be that would be the the yin side, right? That would be the flowing yeah. side. It would be the side that's not so measurable, not so tangible. Purpose, hard to measure. People, we're fluid, we're variable, we're always changing, we're shifting, there's emotions involved, right? And then on the other side we have process and we have profit. Of course, those are the hard, more scientific things, what they might call the yang energy, right? And so a lot of times what we see is we see practices that are really great on one side of that, maybe on, on the purpose, they have the art down, they're incredible designers, so it's amazing work, and they're putting, and maybe they're ne neglecting their people, right? We saw us at SciArc right. just a couple yes. months ago, oh, exploded wow. yes, because of the, the opposite of what you're talking about, which is the complete devaluation of the people. Right? That's the complete, abuse, I think, at SciArc, yeah, it's abuse. But, it's just, yeah. and it's just, let's face it, it's... Has it's deep historical. roots. Deep yes, roots. It it's is. historical. It's, it's not the like way, they invented it's the it. Way. They, yeah, no, they didn't they go out didn't. and say, "I'm going to exploit people." They just they just no. did what no, our they, that was mentors norming. did. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So for you, what's the what do you what do you find is the key to having happy people? So you mentioned mm. a couple things, but go into that. Let's talk about that a so little bit. So I would say because it's I always look at this through the lens of it wasn't long ago I was an employee. I, I, this you know this wasn't a firm I was handed to. I made it. So I have to go back to why did I make this firm? What would you know what, what could have been different for me? And again, you can't change the structural uh, organization of a larger firm and I think that was a, a lot of what why I made something different. But I think there are like ways if our I would say growth. If you're not growing as a designer and architect, if you're not inspired to keep learning and growing, you won't make it because mm. this is something that's an intellectual pursuit. 
we, we are creatives have to keep growing. They have to keep innovating. So I have to provide opportunities and value that. So people know that that's a core value of our business. We're trying to do custom new things on every project. We are trying to do things that people haven't done before, whether it's processes, whether it's uh, materials, whether it's construction, growth and innovation individually. So them as a person growing and innovating. And that also translates into, are they going to conferences? Can they go be inspired and do something? I'm all for it. Because I think that personal, um, your voice, it's again, it's the people's voice, right? Because this isn't, there's no formula. And this isn't like a studio that isn't about the collective we in our design ideas. So I want them to know that their voice matters and that they can pursue what's going to refine that voice and interest them. And that's going to change throughout their career because what it was 10 years ago isn't going to be what it is today. Mm. That's one thing. I have to tell them that they matter. And I think words count. I try to focus on people. I try to call attention to great things in small things client service, client connections, doing good in the community, doing good for ourselves. If people help each other, we have such an amazing, I guess the thing that I'm most proud of of the people that I work with is it's the least competitive work environment I've ever seen. They love each other. They help each other. I've never had someone asked to work on a project. They're just, because our work is really diverse in project types. They're all just in it no matter what. And that is very special. I don't know how that happens because I don't necessarily think it's coming from me. It's this other thing and it's very, very great. So calling folks out for great leadership, good work, just helping with clients, whatever it is, I want to highlight that. And then I want to show them opportunity because if they feel like they're doing the same thing, the same project, the same, mm -mm, we're in a small firm and the value of the small firm is the salad bowl concept that you do not have to do curtain wall details for three years here. That will never happen. So what's the value of that? Getting in front of clients. Everybody in the firm sees clients. Every single person, they talk to them, they know them. That there's no layering. It's all the team. So making sure that they're growing in their careers, that they pitch with us, that they're doing, we have a pro bono practice that everyone's involved in that. It's just, that's how people see, that's how folks stay at a small firm because otherwise there's ladders to climb at corporate firms because there's literally visual titles, there's things, there's layering. And I, I don't want the layers. We don't have titles. Because I feel like titles get in the way of the good stuff um, at a small firm. And I don't know what the value is. If that's super important, you should go work at these amazing larger firms. But if you're going to work here, you better get all the soft stuff. Access, innovation, individuality, recognition, and hopefully pay equity. Uh, we have a lot of women. We've historically had a lot of women in the firm. We have, I think we have four males in the firm, but that's our largest number. I'm, I I support women. I support women who are mothers in, in work. And I want to, this to be a place where everyone's seen invisible. Being a mom isn't a deficit. It's a positive because it's your life and your world. And so people bring that to everything. So I feel like I... I model that, I respect it. And so I, I would say that's that's how I have to deliver for them, for them to be happy and fulfilled working with us. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. And one thing we find with personalities definitely is people who like to be client facing, people who like to be in that yes. position, sometimes it's antithetical or sometimes it's, it's hard to find the person who's the, we use the disc profile among other things, but we might talk the high C's, the more technical, the analytical types. Yep. How do you deal with that? Sometimes people don't want to be in. Do you have any of those types or have you built a, a practice of no. kind of more outgoing, more <laughs> extroverted designers? I, I uh, you know, no, I'd say we're mostly introverted folks. Um, but I do think everyone that's working with us has access to clients. So they build that. I think that accessibility takes away any reticence to working with them. Does that make sense? Because it's yeah. not, it's every day and it's part of the process. So we, we really are collaborative with clients, but we do have people who are definitely more technical, but we also want them to be client facing and they are. And it, I also don't want to push people to places that make them feel uncomfortable. That is not my leadership strategy because then... I don't want a fear-based work life. If you don't want that, fine. But a lot of people do, even if they are more 
Um, Because they want connectivity. Because I think in the end, every designer wants to solve a problem for a person. And so if they can know that person, if they can get closer to that, then they have a little bit more a better ability to solve the problem, but be more more satisfaction and connection to that project. So I would say it's it's layered and, and it, it varies by talented person, but there's no one that doesn't interact with the clients. And I okay. think that is, that's key to service too, because we have a lot of projects. We run a pretty big, we have a lot, we run, we're very, uh, we do a ton of work for the size of firm that we are. And that's only possible if everybody is kind of at, at the table with with the clients. And I feel like that's, even if you're introverted, you're gonna do better work if you know what's going on and you're part of the process in a whole way. And when you were recruiting people, what was your approach with that? How did those conversations go? How do you, because you went from, you know, zero to six in just over a year. Pretty fast, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it was a lot around having access to the work and really having a place where people could dig into work. I'm a big believer in if we're not ready, we're going to push a meeting. I mean, I feel like, and that is something I've never seen before at, at the fir- at the firms I've been at because schedule drove everything because the principal project management team were kind of at the top because they were disconnected from the work. And we don't have project managers as kind of a philosophy because every good designer is a project manager. Every You do not need that role. If you're engaged in the work, you're leading and managing that work. So to me... We're, we're just all doing that work. But because I know the work and I'm in the work, if it's not ready, we have one shot with the client to get them to go where we want them to go. And so we can't, we have to be ready. I'd rather push the meeting if we're not ready and have the right outcome, the right design in front of them than to meet a schedule. And I know everyone has schedules, but this isn't like someone's going to die because we took an extra 10 days. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, this is important. And so I believe in the creative process. I believe in our process. And when we go to the client on the first kind of design meeting, we're showing them pretty baked out options. And if they're not ready, I'm not ready for them to take us down a path because we have to be all in on this. So I take that pretty seriously. So for me... I would say that is a different way to practice. And I think a lot of people were interested in that because it was more time. They were all in the work. And if you take away a project load of, let's say, four or five projects and give them one or two, now they can really be really into that project and have such ownership that's so rewarding. But it is the kind of firm, like a small firm, you're very exposed if if you don't like the work. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. There's a lot of large firms where... You, I've, I've worked at firms where I'm like, what does that person do? And you don't know because they have a really great career and they really don't do anything, right? Mm. This is not that. This is a place for players. We're all playing and you have to want to play. You, you may not need, know everything about the game, but you have to want to play. And I think that's the differentiator. And if you talk to people, you can suss out. It, depending on their resume or where they're at, we do great with like the folks that are kind of early on in their career because then you just teach them and they they can grow into this career knowing that they have they have access to all arcs of the project and they're going to learn how to do it. Does that make sense? So being unafraid to learn, being curious and knowing that like you're on a team, no, nothing's ever reliant on you solely, but we want you to grow and be part of all the things you may not love conceptual design and you may love doing CA or vice versa, but we still need you to be part of it and we need you to be connected to it Mm. because that's a small firm firm. And I do think there's a small firm ethos to this business and I like the work and I like all of it. I like the first time we meet the client and I love punching the project. I like the entire thing matters. And I feel like that's the firm we want to create because the work's better. The work's Mm. just better when people know When the clients know the team members, when the team knows soup to nuts what happened in this project, the work's better. It just factually is. Yeah, this is one of the one of the most inspirational stories I've heard here on the podcast. Betsy, well done. Oh wow. Well, um, it's it's totally real. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can feel that. And what what would you say for you, what's the what's the hardest part about leading a practice? Hmm. Um well I've intentionally thought a lot about scale. I don't think we can, because my, so the reason I started the firm is two reasons. One, to be happier and two, to do amazing work for clients, period. I absolutely run a good business. So that's not the question, but 
that I have to be doing good work. We can't sacrifice the quality and the sort of integrity and design quality that I want to grow. And there is there in in a, in scaling a firm, we get upward into the twenties. It breaks down because then I can't. I I won't know every client. I won't know every project. I, I, it's just gonna get looser. And then we're gonna have an arc of projects that matter, don't matter. Do you know what I'm talking about? Things that pay the bills and things, mm -mm. I don't really wanna run a firm like that. Now, do I know everything about every project right now? No, but I, I have a good sense of it. And I have, I'd say, I, but I would say we're at the edges of anything bigger. I don't know if we can keep the quality that I really want because I just don't know if we can do that. And to me, that's more important than just being bigger. And I. I Again, I'm I'm motivated by quality and happiness. And I also think chasing work with clients that you may not want to work with just to feed folks in your firm is never what I signed up for. That is that to me is just about running a business. And you know, you meet folks who they started the business because they want to run a business and that's their motivator and they probably have an MBA and that's great. I went into this through the lens of the work. I love the work and that's my centerpiece. I'm going to have a great business. We're going to be successful. People are going to feel valued with financial things. But I don't, there's a point where I don't win in my, what makes me happy if we get too big because now I just have to feed people. And I will tell you, we have fired our fair share of clients. If you misbehave, I don't want to deal with you. And if my team doesn't want to work with you, I don't want to work with you. And I do think, I just... At a larger firm, you have to deal with clients that are fussy and difficult because they're large clients. And, you know, and I have the luxury of not having to do that. Yeah. And I, that is one of the biggest joys in my life is that if people are terrible, I just don't want to, well, that's not for us. We're in this to make life better. And if it, and, and you know, there's unhappy people that work at real estate and lots of companies. And I get that. But then just go find someone else because I, I I don't want it and I don't need it. And I think that is um, a privilege, but that comes at a scale. At, at a larger scale, you take those jerks and you deal with them. And I, gosh, I can't do it. Okay. If I wanted to do that, I would have stayed at a corporate firm. Like to me, that's like a, we could fire a client and there's no change. And I, that's an important insurance policy for my team too, because it's like, I have your back. That's not okay. We want to work with folks who really love the work we're doing and respect us. And like, they're part of our team. And you know, you know, there's bad actors everywhere, but in our business, sometimes people can be really prickly. And after a while, no, we don't want to do it. So I do think me as the owner, I have to decide where are my edges? What's the point? What, what do I get for what we, what that would be? And I would say there is a balance. We have to make sure that we, um, you know, there's projects that aren't right for us. There's projects where we have, you know, we're too busy right now. And I'll say, can we wait six months? And a lot of clients will say yes, because a lot of these have relationships with. So can we, can we work it out where, because they know I'm not a huge firm. We're not small, but we also have a pacing that has to work. We also close at the holidays for a chunk of time. So there's things that we do because I want the holidays off. And if you've ever lived not where your family is, it's a PTO suck. Like you can't, yeah. so you blow yeah. all your vacation because of the holiday? That doesn't make sense. So we, we make it just a business close. It's not PTO. It's just called big holiday. And then everyone still has a balanced life because, I mean, that's mm. just good good ideas. Like who? And no one's doing work anyways. And our clients are all fine with it. But it's like, I don't know. There's things about that that are like core to what I think is important. And I think size and, and quality control is like, it, there's a tipping point. And you know this with running a firm and with other firms, you just chase income to pay people. Oh, yeah. I don't, I've never felt like that. And I'm, and I'm very grateful. And I think that's a privilege, but I keep it in check. I know what it takes to be able to have that privilege. It's like, yeah. Keep the clients that you like, serve them well, get rid of ones that don't work, and know know where your time is best spent, right? Betsy, how, how do people get a hold of you if they want to? What are you on any social media platforms? What's oh, the best yes. way to connect with you? What's your 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 platform of choice? Well, we're visual people, so I love Instagram. Yeah. Um, I do the Instagram, so I'm sure everyone's like, you know, I'm, it, once they get to know us, they realize, oh yeah, it's just Betsy doing it. Because again, I don't have any folks, but Instagram is our is our handle of choice because we're visual. So it's Studio 
underscore two times BV. Though underscore once is a hack firm. So we have like over 5,000 followers, you'll know. Um, okay, so and it's then two I'm, underscores it's BV. Two underscore BV, yeah. Right, right. And then it links to our Facebook, but that's a just a, it, Instagram's our preferred. Okay, okay. Well, great. Betsy, it's been an amazing conversation. We appreciate oh, you being here you. on the Business of Architecture and we look forward to having you back sometime and following I your progress. I would love to and I'm excited to know you and can get to know your practice better. This is really okay. great and keep yeah. having these conversations. Thank you. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.